Open in prayer. Father, we just thank you that your word says so much on, on finances. Father, I thank you for this group of people who have um, connected with me here over the last 10 weeks, and I pray you'll guide and direct us as we study some of the um, financial deceptions of this world and compare that to your truth, Lord. Um, and Father, uh, as Jesus said in John 8, 32, to his disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And Father, uh, I just uh, acknowledge, and, and I understand, Lord, you've shown me, it's not a, a power struggle, it's a truth battle. And Satan's uh, number one weapon is lies and deceptions, especially in the financial area. And he's uh, deceived so many people into believing things that are contrary to your word. And I just pray as we go through this uh, session tonight that everyone um, listening and watching would uh, start to understand and realize some of these financial deceptions of the world and replace them with your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next one. So here's the topic for tonight, financial deceptions. Uh, I say in this world, we're bombarded with all kinds of false concepts with regard to finances. I call these uh, financial deceptions. Financial deceptions are beliefs that appear to be correct, but they're contrary to God's word. And uh, often they tempt people to get into debt. The other thing I'd add is uh, with a financial deception is, um, is, is they're not only contrary to God's word, but they're generally not not wise. They're generally things that are going to help you get into debt, become a servant and lender, experience all the stress of all kinds of debt. And God doesn't want us. He want that. He wants us to serve him and not a lender. So here's a question. Here's my first question. Do you think that living um, paycheck to paycheck is, is common? Yeah. What do you think about that? Is living paycheck to paycheck uh, common? I got some answers here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's very common. Yeah. 90, 95%, yep, the Canadians, absolutely. And uh, it's really super common. Um, those are excellent answers. And that one's, that one's simple. We'll get to some more complicated one. Most people are living on credit cards. Actually, when you look at the stats, things have changed a bit since COVID-19. Canadians and Americans uh, are actually becoming more cautious of where they spend their money because most people uh, realize if they haven't lost a job, they realize they could lose a job. It's uh, nobody's immune here. Stats do reveal that in 80 to 90 percent of people that paycheck to paycheck, that is, they spend all their regular income, they have no savings. Let's see what God has to say here. Proverbs 21:20, TLB version. The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. I mean, you can't say it any simpler. The wise man or woman, they save for the future, but the foolish person spend whatever they get. So, what do most people do? They spend all of their regular income. And so as a result, if there's any unexpected expenditures come up, uh, you know, a repair on a car or a house repair or a dental bill or whatever, they're forced into debt. And sometimes even when they have some expected expenditures that they should have planned for, maybe annual insurance premiums or something they didn't save for, so it, uh, they, or a vacation, they put it on their credit cards and uh, they get forced to go into the debt. So it, it's, um, it's after, actually, if you look at the NIV version, it's similar but different. It says in the house of the wise, there's a storage of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. And God wants us to be part of the wise to um, not live paycheck to paycheck. And I, I think the number one way you avoid living paycheck to paycheck, you develop a budget, you determine uh, what you've got coming in, you determine what your, your fixed expenses are, what you have to spend, and you, got, you just got to make sure you spend less than you earn and you have a surplus each month instead of a deficit. You have a surplus so that you can you can pay down debt. And here's um yeah I give some of these examples. People don't save for um, anticipated non-monthly expenses, um, automobile replacement. I mean that's one that very few people uh, save for is automobile replacement. So the stats show that most people in this country and around the world have a car loan all of their life, and that's that's an area that that people get into trouble with. I mean I just talking to someone. This is so common, probably every week or every two weeks, I talk to somebody where they, they, they took out a car loan, the usual 0% financing, nothing down, and uh, they got a payment over four or five years, and in some cases now it's seven years, and then often for some reason they have to get rid of the car before the, the time frame's up, and, and the debt on the car is more than what the value of the car is. So it's actually dangerous to take out a car loan, especially over seven years. I recommend a maximum four. And the best thing to do is actually develop and implement a budget, get, uh, get a surplus of cash each month so you can start saving for your next car so you don't always have to have a car loan. Um, unexpected expenditures can arise. Some other things, we need an emergency fund. Everybody should have an emergency fund. For example, uh, lots of people, one spouse is out of work now. It's really, you know, we have recessions about every 10 years, plus or minus. 
We got one now. Yes, this one is worse than normal because of COVID-19, but uh, we, recessions are not uncommon. They've been happening since, uh, since, since even back in, 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 in biblical times. They've been happening for centuries. And then also, um, most people are not saving for long-term needs, such as um, retirement or children education. Most people today in this country and around the world, the young people come out of school with a, with a tremendous amount of, of debt. So, um, and a lot of that can be avoided if people, um, if people learn to manage money in, in a biblical fashion. So Jesus recommends that we save for future needs. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Now you may, wanna, may not want to build a tower, but you may want to, if you're really young, save for university or save for a down payment on a house. Uh, more middle-aged, you may want to save for your kid's education. May want to save even for a down payment on a house or whatever. Or save for cars, I mentioned. Or you may, at middle age, want to start saving for retirement. But So Christ is saying, suppose you want to do something. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. So I think you can see uh, Christ is saying, Christ is actually admonishing us in this parable to plan ahead. We need to, uh, we need to plan ahead. Um, so in summary, living paycheck to paycheck, it's not consistent with God's word. Um, God's admonition is we should plan ahead and save for future needs. So this concept, this financial deception that it's okay to live paycheck to paycheck, that's a worldly mindset. And it's, uh, it's certainly not what God wants. The second financial deception is debt restructuring will solve your financial problems. Let me give you a real life story. Uh, I could give you with this with a lot of people, but one thing about this individual I'm gonna talk about is, is a bit unique, but uh, the, the facts of his situation are generally very common. A number of years ago, it's probably um, 18 years ago, a fellow came and he sat down with me in my boardroom and him and his wife had done what most people did. Uh, they accumulated a lot of debt on credit cards. And he was just asking me, do you think I should take out a first line of credit against our home in order to pay off the credit cards? I said, well, I think that's a good idea um, because the, the interest rate on the first line of credit is a lot less than the credit cards, no question about it. And often in, in the ministry, we'll advise people to, 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 to do that. But I really emphasized to him, I said, the problem here is, is you, by the way, I, I emphasized to him, when you take out the line of credit and you pay down the credit card debt, you're not solving your financial problems. You're treating the symptom, you're lowering your interest costs, which is a good thing, but uh, you're treating the symptom. The problem is you and your wife have been spending more than you're making and you need to um, you need to reduce your expenditures. Um, you need to develop and implement a budget. Make sure you're spending less than you earn, and have a surplus so you can start paying down debt and have a surplus in case you have um, unexpected expenditures. And he agreed with all the advice I gave. And then about three years later, he turned up in my office again. Same problem. They had run up uh, the credit cards. They had now had previously, in about a year before, increased their line of credit. They used up their maximum line of credit. And he said, "Listen." Uh, this this credit card interest rate is just killing us and if we don't make the minimum payments so uh, you know we're having trouble making the minimum payments we're going to have bad credit rating so do you think it's okay to take out a second mortgage against my home and i said well that's that's okay uh it's not the greatest the problem with that is you're now spreading it out over 25 years or 30 years or whatever as opposed to uh paying it off shorter but you know he was really in a pickle and i said you probably have no choice at least the interest rate is less but i said again the problem is you and your wife are spending more than you're making, and you got you got to learn to be content with less. Give him a few scriptures. I said you got to learn to be content with less. You got to put some uh, constraints on on the budget. And maybe you got to take the, the pair of scissors and do some plastic surgery with the credit cards. You got to cut them up. He agreed with all the advice I gave him. And then about four years later, he showed up my office again. The, again, the same problem. This time they had a second mortgage on their home. They had a big lines of credit. Their credit cards they had about eight or ten of them were fully maxed. And um, he was in a position, the only option he had was to start down, drawing down his retirement savings plan. Well, that creates two new problems. One, it creates a, a tax liability. And secondly, the concern they wouldn't have enough to uh, save for retirement. Now, what's in this, this is a story I could tell you, I've seen several thousand times, no question, since 1982, um, this kind of thing where people first use the first line of credit to pay off the credit cards, then a second mortgage on the home, and then they withdraw the money from their retirement plan. This is really common. But what's unique about this individual was he was a chartered professional accountant. He understood exactly what I was saying. He agreed with what I was saying, but him and his wife didn't follow up. And as James says, we, we need to not, not just be a, a hearer of a word, a hearer of the word, but also a doer. We need to follow up. And what Christ is saying in the parable of the tower, he says, if you don't plan ahead, you're foolish. And he, he wasn't doing that. And him and his wife were, were suffering the consequences. One other thing of interest. A couple of years later, after that, he contacted me because he had um, 
lost his job with one particular firm. And he said, I'm now uh, a financial advisor and would you send clients to me? And I, I politely, uh, uh, I politely said no, but uh, you know, there he is as a financial advisor and, and lots of financial advisors in this country and around the world are still managing money the world's way, not God's way. And, um, and they're, they're not, they're not doing it according to biblical principles. In some cases, they know what they are. They're just not following them. In other cases, they just don't know what they are. But uh, this fellow did know because I did talk to him. So debt restructuring, it can lower your interest costs, but it doesn't deal with the underlying problem that you're spending more than you're earning. So some common reasons for spending more than you earn over a long period would be a lack of knowledge. God admonishes us. I like Proverbs uh, chapter 24, 3 and 4. By wisdom, a house is built. Through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. So um, notice the emphasis on wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Um, sometimes people are not managing money God's way. First of all, sometimes they don't know what the biblical principles are. But also, they just uh, they don't have the understanding and the, um, the knowledge of what's going on in their finances. Nobody's uh, tracking the expenses. No one's keeping track of their debt load. So often when I sit down with a couple, when we get all the papers out on the table and we list out what their debts were today and we list them out what they were a year or two before and they'll see that they went up significantly, often they're astonished. And often, sometimes one spouse can have a credit card that the other spouse doesn't know about. So we need, that. we need to understand our financial facts. Another reason is a lack of discipline. Like that fellow, him and his wife lacked discipline. He knew what he needed to do, um, but they didn't do it. They continued with the same lifestyle that they couldn't afford. And, and uh, we need to be willing to sacrifice as needed. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me. And there could be a spiritual problem such as an ungodly attitude. And here's some, uh, here's some examples. We did discuss this in uh, more detail in a previous session. But some ungodly, let, let's put it this way. Sometimes the root cause of financial problem can go beyond the financial into the spiritual. Some spiritual problems that can uh, give rise to financial problems would include covetousness. Remember in Exodus chapter 20, actually one of the commandments that God gave, one of the Ten Commandments was, was he said, you shall not covet your neighbor's ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Covetousness can be a, a, an ungodly attitude that causes people to spend more than they're making and get into debt. A lack of contentment, Hebrews 13, 5 um, says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Greed. Jesus said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. Selfishness can uh, cause people to get into trouble. And certainly pride. Uh, sometimes people, it makes them feel good when they have nicer things than other people. And it makes them feel better than other people. And uh, we know what scripture says, James 4, 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And these are all worldly attitudes or mindset. And they represent ungodly thinking. So what's required? You know, these two key verses come up quite often, but I think they're really key. I could give a few others, several others actually, but these are, I like to focus on a couple of verses and just get people meditating on them. And let's, let's just say these two verses together. I know I can't hear you, but you can hear yourself. Here's the first one, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how do you renew your mind? How do you change the way you think? Joshua 1 gives the answer. Let's say it together. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Now, by the way, that success may not necessarily, I'm not preaching the prosperity gospel here. The success could be when God's people manage money God's way and they give regularly to the Lord's work, more, more often than not, God will bless them financially. But remember, God can bless you other ways um, in in. In, in, that are non-financial, bless you with good health, a good marriage, good rapport with your kids, um, have an excellent ministry, whatever. There's many other blessings that God can provide. But one thing's for certain, if you manage money the world's way, the probabilities are very high in due course, it may take several years, that you're gonna get into financial difficulty and later suffer the consequences. The third financial deception is this, the world believes that smart people use other people's money. This is an absolute lie. Um, and, the only way this is true is if you can predict the future, that is, you know, the direction of the markets and the economy. Yes, if you knew the direct directions of the market and you, you could borrow money and invest and make a lot of money very quickly, that's true. That would be smart. But nobody knows uh, the direction of the market. Look at the bottom there, Proverbs 27, 1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know a day will bring forth. I've watched uh, stock markets and stuff like that since uh, 
actually the late 1970s. The experts, they can make their predictions, but you know, so often they're wrong. Nobody can predict where the markets are going on a consistent basis because no one, uh, on, no one knows the future, only, only God does. So he's the only one that knows the future and we can just make our, our, best, our best guess. And so there are no, there are no sure deals. Um, so this, this concept of smart people use other people's money is from the world, it's not from God. The emphasis in scripture is to use minimal debt or better no debt, it's supported by scripture. Interesting, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, God promised his people, read through that sometime in detail, that if they fully obeyed him, he would bless them in so many ways and if you go down to verse 12, um, it says that he's going to bless them so that they're going to be lenders and not borrowers. In the Bible, debt was considered to be a curse and not a blessing. And even today, debt, debt is, it's usually a curse. It's usually not a, it's a, it's a, it's a curse or it's a burden. It's not a blessing. It's, um, I've had so many emails from people um, over the last, since COVID started back in March, that have thanked me for the biblical advice that I've given over the last few decades. And saying, you know, this really works. You know, hey, my wife and I, we, we're debt free, or they may have be almost debt free, or, or they may just say, okay, we got a modest mortgage, and we got a, we got six months worth of uh, expenses uh, saved up in a savings account. Very few people have that, and so we're not worried. We praise God for the wisdom in His Word, and we praise, thank the Lord for, for, for what You taught. And uh, it's not me. It's, it's, it's God through His Word and His Spirit touching their hearts. It's not me. I'm just teaching what the Bible says on finances. But God's truth is the truth. It's, it's real. The world has lots of deceptions. And one of those deceptions is that smart people use other people's money. As you're going to see in a minute, the real uh, truth is smart people use as little debt as possible and they pay it off as quick as possible. Again, I want to say it's not a sin to borrow. It's a sin to borrow and not repay. Psalms 37, 21. But God warns of the dangers of debt. Psalms, uh, sorry, Proverbs 22, 7. And God instructs us to put him first and not the bank. And uh, if we, if we, uh, trust God to provide for our needs and not trust the bank or the credit cards, God, God's going to meet those needs. He's promised them. So uh, and I'd also say this during difficult times, those with debt usually suffer the most and those with cash usually can get some, some great bargains. So um, the key point is this on this uh, point from God's perspective, smart people do not use other people's money. Rather smart people borrow off as little as possible. They borrow as little as possible and they pay it off as quickly as possible. So the name of the game is to use, use minimal debt. So here's a question for you. How does the world define financial freedom? How does the world fin define financial freedom? So here's the question. How does the world define financial freedom? Whoever has the most toys wins. That's a good one. <laughs> but what did Paul say? We brought nothing into this world and we shall take nothing out of it. A split second after we die. Um, it's, it's, um, it, it's of no, no value to us. But you know, as I've said many times, when you give to God's work and you manage money God's way, there's promises in heaven, uh, promises that God's gonna provide rewards in heaven. I think of Matthew um, 27, 19, where Jesus said, for the son of man will come in his father's glory with his angels and he will, will reward each person according to what they've done. Uh, having enough money to do what you want in life, that's certainly a definition of the, the Lord's, uh, of the world's uh, definition of financial freedom. Uh, being able to um, have anything at any time you want, true, to buy whatever you want. Winning the lottery, certainly that's how they, um, they advertise the lotteries, right? Imagine the freedom. It's, um, but I can tell you this, I've seen lots of people, very successful entrepreneurs. You got to understand, I do two things. In ministry, I teach God's Word on finances. There we help most people. I'd say most people are average or below average income, some above average income in my accounting practice. We do owner-managed private businesses, generally successful entrepreneurs, because my background is, is specialized corporate tax. And I've seen a lot of very successful people, and I can tell you this much, having more money doesn't bring happiness in and of itself. I think of a couple um, that I did some work for a number of years ago. They had uh, their credit, they came to Canada, and they, they worked hard, and they built up a business. And I'd say after about 25 years, they were worth about $30 million. They had way more than enough money to retire on. And I'll tell you, they were the most unhappy couple I ever met. Uh, they were always arguing and fighting. They, um, uh, they, they were always afraid, where, where should I invest my money or what should I do with my money? And they were afraid somebody was gonna, gonna rip them off or, or steal from them, it was unbelievable. And, and uh, they were arguing and fighting so much that it's unfortunate. I mean, I, I didn't wish this happened, but a couple of years ago they split up and uh, they weren't happy at all. I think the only reason they stayed together before was so they didn't have to split their assets, but they ended up splitting Anyhow, so other um, ways the world defines financial freedom, self-defendant, 
independence. Um, I'd say independence there. Do whatever you want. Be rich in money. Uh, savings and being debt free. Yeah. Debt free, having unlimited amounts of money. Having no needs. That's true. Peace is financial freedom. That's true. And that's how God would define it. I Someone, it's uh, God defines financial freedom as being obedient to his laws and direction. Do not borrow unless you can pay for it. I agree. Money equates to happiness and security. That's absolutely true. It does uh, for a lot of people. Yeah, it's, um, these, these are good answers. Thank you very much. Now, how does God define financial freedom? How would you say the Lord defines financial freedom? Ability to have friends, influence? Okay, okay. Spend uh, less than what you make and being able to give as much as you like, having no debt. Yeah. Being content, that's a good comment. Uh, remember Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, we shall take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. I remember Paul had to learn to be content, Philippians chapter 4. And he did that depending on the Lord, Jesus Christ. It was his relationship with Christ and his focus on eternal values that made the difference and enabled him to learn to be content. Trust in him every step of the way. Yeah. God's definition of financial freedom, being free from financial anxiety. I agree with that's a good one. It's um, so many people are anxious today. Uh, they're anxious most of the time about finances, but particularly today because there's so many things that are uncertain. The economy, lots of people out of work. Uh, the COVID-19, you know, obviously is not under control yet. And the stock markets, if you watch them at all, have been extremely volatile lately. God's peace, that's true. I mean, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 14, 27. It's um, entrusting in God to uh, provide for our needs and not worrying about that. That's true. Matthew 6, 31 to 33. Remember Jesus said, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you. I think being free from, from worry is a key one. So here's what I had. You folks had some good answers. I just had a comment that many wealthy people have no peace in the area of finances. They're not financially free. More money doesn't add to financial freedom. It can add to more worry and stress. I've seen that many times. They're stressed out about money. Uh, where should I invest my money? What if I lose my money? I can give you so many examples of that. I've given one already. I find true financial freedom only comes from having God's peace in the area of finances. And again, this key verse, John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Of course, we know in Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, God's promised us his peace as we pray, as we focus on him, as we focus on things of eternal value. And uh, as I talked about in my, my seminar, my financial moments and uh, at the beginning of this series, and my half hour shows and managing money during COVID-19, one of the first things I do is try to help people experience God's peace. So, because if you're at peace, you're gonna think in a calm, logical, biblical fashion and probably make very wise decisions. But if you're operating out of fear, if, if because of the fear you see on the media, like so many people in March, April, and May, they just automatically deferred the mortgage payment on their house for six months because that's what was allowed by most of the banks but not realizing that that six months payment you deferred actually now becomes a probably about eight or nine or ten months at the end of your mortgage because the banks aren't doing a, a freebie here there's compound interest on that so you're actually worse off and your mortgage goes on longer now if you absolutely had to do it and there's no option i get that but a lot of people were making that decision just out of, out of fear and others were making it because they'd run up so much debt and they needed to get their, their start to get their debt uh, the credit card debt, that kind of stuff under control. Here's my suggestion to obtain God's peace and joy with respect to finances. Um, believe that God and his truth, believe that God and his truth in his word will set you free from the deceptions of this world. I love this scripture in John 8, 32, to the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, you are true, really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's God's truth from his word, the Bible, that can set us free from the financial deceptions of this world. That's the key. It's God's truth that can set us free. Satan can't fool you and deceive you. The world can't fool you and deceive you. A financial advisor cannot fool you and deceive you. If you know what God's word says and you know what the truth is, then you can make decisions that are consistent with his word 
And I'm, I'm, I know that God will bless you. He'll, he will at least give you enough to meet your needs and he'll bless you and he'll give you peace, his peace in the area of finances, which very, very few people have. The second thing to obtain God's peace and joy with respect to finances is learn to be content. As Paul talked about, remember Paul, and remember Paul wrote this when he was in prison. This Paul was really quite something, the Apostle Paul. Well, look what he said, for I've learned to be content. We know how committed he was, but he had to learn to be content. We all have to learn to be content. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It was his relationship with Christ that gave him the strength and the ability to learn to be content no matter what the circumstances are. We know that God's in control. Psalms 103, 19 says the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. He's in control. So if you've got some financial problems now, God has allowed them. You may not have caused them. You might have caused them yourself by mismanaging money or Sometimes it can be uh, something that comes out of the blue that's not your fault. I get that. Those things can happen to Christian as well. But God's allowed it. He's sovereign. He's in charge of everything. And he's allowed it for a purpose. So I think one of the key things is pray and ask God to reveal to you what, what he wants you to learn through this. And also in the process for most people need to learn to be content as Paul talked about here. Another thing to obtain God's peace with respect to finances, acknowledge that the accumulation of money and material things, it's temporary. It's just of no eternal value. It's of no eternal value whatsoever. Uh, if you remember Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21, that's where Jesus said, Do not build up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but build up for yourselves treasures in heaven. In other words, do things today that are going to impact eternity. So if you forgo some material thing that you wanted, and let's say you give it to God's work, and like I said, even one person comes to Christ a thousand years from now, 30 million years from now, that's going to mean something. And the other thing is, there's going to be rewards in heaven. I'm actually doing a couple of sessions now that'll be on TV and radio about managing money and just the impact that it's going to have in eternity. And that some of the, just an idea of some of the rewards that God could give us in heaven for managing money God's way. I mean, the Bema is clear. It's, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 10, that basically says that uh, for everyone is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, we're all going to be made accountable for how we, what did you do with what God entrusted to you? Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us will give account of himself to God. Now, as Christians, if you're born of the spirit of God, you've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. Your salvation's not at stake. But rewards or lack of rewards are at stake with respect to how you manage the money, the time and the resources and the talents that God gave you while, while you're here on earth. So I really encourage people, manage money God's way. Um, give generously to God's work. As the saying goes, you can't take it with you, but you can, you can send it on ahead, and that's into eternity. By the way, the, uh, the, the stocks there in, in heaven, they pay dividends forever, uh, for eternity. Not, not 30 years, not 1,000 years, but more than forever. It does not not even 30 million years. It, they go on forever. So I'm talking about this, the stocks being the spiritual blessings that God gives when we're in heaven. Um, as a result of, you know, you want to hear the words, you know, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share, share your master happiness. Those are the kinds of words that you want to hear from the Lord. And you need to experience the joy, joy of giving. As Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And the last point to experience God's peace is recognize you're a steward. You're not an owner. Your responsibility is to apply financial principles, God's financial principles, do God's will. God's promise, if we meet him first, he, if we put him first, he'll meet our needs. That's his promise. Yes, you could uh, have some investments that go down in value when the market goes down. But remember, if you've done what God wants you to do, if you've diversified the portfolio in accordance with Ecclesiastes 11.2, you've got no debt, you've got a cushion of cash in your personal cash flow, um, you can ride out the storm. And you just, just need to continue to trust God is, is wherever the market's going, whatever happens. If you've done what God wants you to do, you can trust God to meet your needs. So in summary, one of the financial deceptions of this world is financial freedom comes from having lots of money and material things. The truth is true financial freedom um, comes only from having God's peace and joy and contentment in the area of finances. So before I go on here, someone said that they can be thankful, even though uh, we're in a pandemic. Um, let me go to the next one. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate them. Um, financial deception number five, it makes sense to buy now and pay later. Today, almost anything can be purchased with little or no down payment. Advertising, advertisements enticing you to for no payments and no interest for one to two years are very common. 
Uh, it, it's amazing what we can buy today. I mean, I was born and raised in this country, and I think 40, 50 years ago, you couldn't buy furniture unless you paid cash. And what used to happen then is, uh, I remember my mother, if she wanted something that cost 100 bucks, you put down $10, and then you bring in $10 each month, and after you paid it off, then you got it. It was called the layaway plan. Now today, you can get all these things. It can be furniture, it can be anything. You can buy cars, you can buy anything um, with no down payment. All of it's financed and theoretically no interest until for one or two years. Now, by the way, the interest is built into the price. And then with some of these retailer incentives, you've got to be really dangerous. I remember I was counseling a, a couple just a few years ago and they had borrowed actually uh, about $20,000 on, um, on buying furniture from one of the large retail companies. What they didn't understand, if they didn't pay it by the last day of the 18 months that they had, the interest rate of, uh, it was about 18% was gonna be retroactive to day one. So that was like 36% on 20, 20 grand. Do the math, that was like $7,200 if they didn't pay it. And so we had to scramble around and get them a line of credit to be able to pay that. Otherwise they would have owed another 7,200 bucks. Um, you gotta read the fine print on these things and borrowing money, when you, when you get a retailer incentive, you're boring to buy furniture, that's extremely dangerous. It's, it's uh, very dangerous. If you don't have the money, you shouldn't buy it. By the way, there's usually lots of good deals around in Kijiji and other, where, other places on used furniture. The other thing is today, easy credit creates a big temptation to buy now and pay later. Easy credit is a big temptation. Um, you know, I, how many people here, I'm sure if I ask everybody, if we're in a room, I usually ask people, raise your hand if, you, if you've been, um, if, if you've received a credit card unsolicited and, and the answer is, uh, answered pretty well everybody has. I just got another one uh, uh, just recently. Uh, you know, I just, just just cut it all up, you know, an unsolicited credit card. It's, um, they even give them to the students in school. They have no job, they have no income, but they still give it to them. And this credit card companies aren't doing you a favor. They're doing it because they make horrendous amounts of money on the, on the credit cards, um, 18, 28%. It's just unbelievable. So. Financial deception number five, it makes sense to buy now and pay later. That's a deception. God's directive is for us to wait for his provision and his timing. Psalms 37, seven says, rest on the Lord and wait patiently for him. And Lamentations 324 states, the Lord is my portion and therefore I will wait for him. So those are, those are key, uh, key scriptures. So if you have a need, please pray and wait upon the Lord. God can provide in many ways, such as unexpected income, a better deal, or perhaps another alternative. Unfortunately, many Christians do not pray and do not wait for God's provision. In a sense, they don't even give God a chance. I've seen so many cases in the last several decades where people wanted a car, they needed a car. And most people, what do they do? They just go to the local dealership, 0% financing. They got a big loan that's going to take them four, five, seven years to pay off. They don't pray. They don't wait upon the Lord. I've seen so many cases. I've probably seen 70, 80 cars given away where Christians have prayed and asked God to provide them with a car. And, and it's not a coincidence. A few months later, someone at their church or someone they know either gives them a car or gives it to them almost nothing. I think of even a pastor who used to buy a, a new car every four years. And he decided, he went through one of the workshops that I did and decided, you know, I want to get out of this, this, these debt payments. They're becoming a burden. And he just started to pray. And you know what? A, a, a little lady in his church had a Toyota with not a lot of kilometers on it. And she, she gave it to him. An elderly lady gave, gave the pastor a, a car. Uh, so, and, and we've seen other people with um, single moms and other people just where, where God gives them something that's just amazing. So I find that unfortunately many Christians, they don't pray. They don't uh, wait for God's provision. And in a sense, they don't even give, give God a chance to provide. In Matthew ch chapter six, we've gone through this before, but this is a, this is a foundational verse. Where Jesus said, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Those are needs, what we shall eat, drink, or wear. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And remember, God promised to meet our needs, but not necessarily our wants and desires. God's instructed us to be content with what he's provided. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. That's Hebrews 13.5. So this, uh, last, this financial deception, in summary, God has promised that he will meet our needs if we put him first. And that's his desire for us to wait for his provision and his timing. When you look at all the uh, stuff on the media and, and stuff today, the radio, the TV, it's all, all the advertisements are, are really their pressure sales, most of them. Hey, you need to get this, you gotta buy you know, within two or three days. Uh, they don't want you to think and pray about it. They want you to just come in 
and, uh, and, and get this great deal. They're, they're trying to, um, and don't worry if you don't have the money, we'll, we'll finance it for you. Well, it doesn't make sense to buy now and pay later. It's more biblical to save for future needs and actually pay cash. So here's the last financial deception. Bankruptcy will solve my financial problem. The Bible is clear that God doesn't want, he doesn't want Christians to go bankrupt. The Bible says, the wicked borrow and do not repay and put the righteous give generously. Notice the, what, what this scripture is saying is if you, if you go bankrupt, especially if you've gone bankrupt and it was because of, you know, you violate a number of biblical financial principles, um, that's a sin. Now God can forgive that. I'll talk about it in a minute, in a minute, but the wicked borrow and do not repay. Notice the, the, um, contrast between the wicked the wicked borrow and do not repay implying it's, it's a sin to borrow and not repay but the righteous give generously the implication here is the righteous not only meets their obligations pays their debts but they go the second mile they actually give when they don't have to give they give generously um bankruptcy is also a bad testimony god says in the same way let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven what kind of a light in the world of darkness is a christian who goes bankrupt or what kind of a light in the world of darkness is a Christian who doesn't pay their debts on time. Or I would say another thing, try to witness to some of those creditors when you haven't paid them, you have no testimony. They don't want to listen to you. But if you treat people well, you pay them on time that develops credibility. And I found over the years, I, we pay all our bills on time here that develops credibility. It actually earns you the right to actually share Christ with them. Now they may not accept it, but because they respect you and respect how you manage money and, and appreciate that you pay their bills on time, they, they, they more often than not will listen. They'll actually listen when you start to talk about things, things of the Lord. But if you haven't paid your bills on time, you have no credibility. They don't, they don't want to listen to you. Uh, and the other thing too is bankruptcy just treats the symptom. The real problem is generally the violation of God's principles, which usually continue even if the current debts are eliminated by bankruptcy. I've seen so many cases, so many cases in the last 40 years where people have gone bankrupt once and within two or three years, they're in trouble again. Cause it's amazing. I, I, I just counseled a couple not that long ago, they went bankrupt and within three, four months after they'd actually declared bankruptcy, credit cards were given to them. Well, that's not a good thing. I, I, I really strongly recommend it. They don't, they don't take the credit card, just have a debit card uh, and, and use cash you know because they they had a history of, of misusing the credit cards and if you have a credit card stick it in the drawer and only take it out when you absolutely have to but it's um the problem is this when people go bankrupt and their debts are cleared off they think they've solved their financial problem but often they haven't what's happened is they didn't take the time to learn what the biblical principles were that they violated and how to change that going forward they didn't meditate on god's words when i've gone through his word and his spirit to change the way they think and that's what it requires we've got to It'd be nice if we could hire an IT guy, a computer programmer, and just reprogram our brain, but that takes time. It requires meditating upon our, on God's word to change the way we think. And also, there has to often be a change in our heart and our, and our desire. So what I find is the, the violation of the biblical principles will, will continue uh, after bankruptcy, even if the current debts are, 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 uh, are eliminated. So it's, it's not a good thing. I would say this, if you've de declared bankruptcy already, I'd encourage you in several ways. God loves you and God will forgive the act of bankruptcy or the violation of the biblical principles that led up to it if you confess those sins. Remember 1 John 1, 9? Um, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Secondly, in prayer, ask God to reveal to you the real causes of your bankruptcy. What I find often is an individual or couple, they'll, they'll point to something. Like a lot of people are saying, these days i'm going bankrupt because i lost my job because of covid 19. but if, if you back the truck up and you say okay where are you at financially just prior to covid 19 and how did your cash flow look for the prior year or two prior to that most of the time i've seen a number most of the time they were spending more than they're making they're accumulating debt they had no savings proverbs 21 20 admonishes us to have some savings if god's people are following god's way of managing money she'd so probably have six to nine months worth of savings so even if they're out of work for a season of time. It shouldn't be a disaster. And I, like I said, I got a number of emails of people thanking me for the biblical advice that indicated that they've actually followed that. So um, we need to ask God when you go bankrupt to reveal the causes, the underlying causes, what was your part in it? There may have been a knockout punch. I'm not saying there couldn't have been like a loss of a job, but often it's, it's people that are teetering on the edge. They accumulate a lot of debt. They spent more than they made and then losing the job or whatever it is, is just the, the final knockout punch. But if they had been managing money God's way, they would, they would have been okay. So 
Remember David's prayer, Psalms 139? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So we need to pray and ask God to reveal what was our part in, in going bankrupt. Or even if you're in financial difficulty, what was your part? And, and, and deal with that. And you know, as you, as you, one thing I say over and over again, as you start to manage money God's way, we've actually had some people, even in this webinar, started managing money God's way 10 weeks ago, nine, 10 weeks ago, and they've seen some difference already. And by the way, I'm gonna be asking people, Henry will be sending out an email tomorrow, asking for your feedback. And we'd love to hear what impact this teaching of God's word on finances has had in your life and the way you think and also the way you manage money. So um, we need to um, pray and ask God to just, just direct us to and, and help us to learn um, his principles and, and apply them. So, and the third thing I'd say if you declare bankruptcy is develop and implement a budget to ensure that you're spending less than your earning so you have a surplus um, for non-monthly expenses and unexpected, unexpected expenditure. You need to develop that surplus. So the last financial deception is the bankruptcy will solve my financial problems. That's not true. Um, it's, uh, generally the, it's generally the true cause is violation of one or more biblical principles. And depending on God, you need to learn and apply God's financial principles. So here's a summary of the six types of financial deceptions I've listed in this uh, seminar. There's others as well, but here's six common ones. Um, most, many people, and these are all lies from the world, living paycheck to paycheck is okay. Debt restructuring will solve your financial problems. Smart people use other people's money. Financial freedom is attained by having lots of money. It makes sense to buy now and pay later and bankruptcy will solve my financial problems. So those are all financial deceptions and we need to replace them renounce those deceptions and replace them with God's, God's truth. How do we avoid being deceived in the air of finances? But the key is simple. You gotta understand and apply God's truth with respect to finances. Most people have believed lies from the world and Satan and as a result, they're managing money the world's way rather than God's way. And for those who knowingly or unknowingly manage money in a worldly fashion, in due course, they will suffer the consequences. They may not occur until they're out of a job or until a recession hits, such as the one we're in now, but uh, they, they'll, they'll eventually suffer the consequences. And again, these key verses, we went over them earlier. I won't go through them again, just uh, the scripture about, we need to meditate on God's word, is what we need to do. Get into the word and allow God through his word and his spirit to change uh, the way we think about money and material things. I don't have it there on the screen, but Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's word is powerful and it's true. And that's what we need to get in. And then we won't be deceived by this world. So we got a few case studies, but before I go into this case study, I just thought I'd see, uh, now the principles in the case studies are in, are in the book. If you happen to have the book, they are there. Uh, I'm just doing them in a summary fashion. Of course, the comments that I add, and some cases are in the book, but some cases like I just throw out a lot of comments and uh, real life case studies that, often or not even in the book, because I've just seen so many. So um, here's this case study. Bob, 62 years of age, and Joan are married. They have two grown children. Bob and Joan both became Christians when they were teenagers. Over the past 35 years of marriage, Bob has earned an above average income, and Joan worked part-time. Bob and Joan plan to retire in three years. To ensure that their finances are in order, they decided to meet for the first time with a financial advisor. Much to their dismay, the financial advisor informed them that they will both have to continue working and save several hundred dollars per month for another 14 years before they can afford to retire. Bob and Joan were surprised and disappointed to learn that statistically, they were not able to retire for 14 years. Upon reflection, they acknowledged they had not made it a priority to pay off their credit cards, personal line of credit, or save for future needs such as retirement or healthcare costs. In addition, Bob had recently been diagnosed with certain health issues of which although not life-threatening the doctor recommended that bob work part-time however bob knew he must continue working full-time in order to pay off his debts and save for retirement so question what are the financial deceptions that is the lies that bob and joan have likely believed so you got these facts about this couple what financial deceptions have they likely believed and if you can provide a reference to scripture so let me know what financial deception Kathy has an interesting question. How do we know when our meditating, praying, and giving, helping, et cetera, is enough um, without becoming exhausted and ill? I mean, scripture says pray without ceasing. I would say pray until um, God gives you an answer, until um, God gives you peace. Um, remember the uh, the parable of the the widow who just kept coming to the king who uh, 
didn't fear men or God, but but uh, because of her persistence, uh, the king eventually, the unrighteous king eventually gave her what she wanted. So just keep praying. And, and you know, I actually ask God if, ask God to just confirm, clarify that you're praying for the right things. Because sometimes God doesn't answer a prayer because he doesn't want us to have something. Often I see Christians praying, they want a bigger house or a nicer car, they want some material thing. And sometimes God just knows that that's not good for them. And so he doesn't provide it. So um, some of the uh, financial deceptions that Joan and um, um, Bob have believed, they're using other people's money, the credit cards and the loans, absolutely. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They're overspending, not likely saving and possibly and probably not tithing, it's not mentioned there, but I can tell you this, the number one hindrance to tithing is when people accumulate debt. That's the number one hindrance to tithing. Uh, when people in inadvertently spend more than they make and they accumulate debt, as the debt goes up, the giving goes down. Um, that's the biggest hindrance to give. Certainly, and we got some good answers here. Buy now, pay later. Um, these, are, these are all good answers. Thank you for them. And you basically have got them. Here's what I had. Uh, Bob and Joan believe the lie that it's okay to live paycheck to paycheck and as they spent all their regular income. They did not save for future needs, so they violated Proverbs 2120. Given their credit card debt, they likely believe the financial deception. It makes sense to buy now and pay later. Proverbs 227 warns of the dangers of debt. And given their personal line of credit and their credit cards, they probably believe that debt restructuring would solve their financial problem. When I sit down with an individual or a couple and they list out their debt liabilities on, on say, Form number one of the Copeland bludgeoning system, and we see up often a personal line of credit of twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and we see credit debt of ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I can pretty well guess what's happened. They've been spending more than they're making for several years. They've probably already taken out the line of credit and paid off their credit cards because that's typically what the bank advises. Don't worry, we can solve your problem. We'll give you this line of credit, and you pay off your credit cards. Treats the symptom, not the problem. They still continue to spend the same way, and they run up more debt. I can pretty well tell what, what, what's going on. So um, here's the second question. Assume that you are Bob and Joan's financial coach. What biblically-based financial advice would you give them? Provide a reference to scripture. So what would you advise Bob and Joan? Thank you for that testimony. Someone here is indicating the number one hindrance to their generosity has been debt obligations. And that's really common. Satan, Satan wants Christians to be in debt. It stresses people out. It reduces giving to God's work. And, it, and the stress often... Uh, destroys marriage relationships as well. So some advice for this couple, they need to save for the future. They need to get rid of the credit cards, good answers. They need to cut down on their expenses, absolutely. They need to develop and implement a budget. They need to pray and make a plan. They need to live by a budget, yep. They need to tithe. I didn't mention it here, but I can tell you they, they very likely were not tithing. Um, they need to live within their means. Meditate on scriptures with respect to finances. That's a good one. Help change the way they think. Cut up the credit cards. Pay down uh, the high interest rate, right? Stop overspending. No credit cards. Save. These are all good answers. Uh, be content with what they have. Thank you for, for those answers. Here's what, what I had. First, in faith, pray and ask God for his wisdom. James 1, 5. And his direction. They need God's wisdom and direction. They need to confess the sin, the sin that they they violated many um, biblical uh, financial principles. Most people, um, because unfortunately in most churches, when, when anything on finances is taught, it's usually just about tithing. Remember, giving represents 3% of the 2,350 references in the Bible. The other 97% are rarely taught in the local church. Why? Because it's certainly in this country. I've talked to some people in the States they are rarely taught in the Bible school and the seminary. I don't know well why that's a deception from the world. Uh, it it uh, finances is such an integral part of everybody's life. Everybody has to manage finances, and so why wouldn't they? If they taught it to the pastors, I think we would in the Bible schools and seminaries would see a lot more teaching in the church. So, um, so they they people need to confess the sin. They need to get into God's word with respect to finances. Um, God through His word and His Spirit can, can touch their hearts and change the way they think. Um, and of course, they, they need to meditate upon um, certain scriptures. Um, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's a really interesting chapter. I can't know if I'll remember it all, but it says, These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on the, your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbol on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Post them on the door houses, door frames of your gates. In other words, have God's word in front of you all the time. So you're thinking the way God thinks. That's the key. That's what Romans 12 is all about. And that's the key to learning to manage money God's way. 
And actually living a godly life is to think the way God thinks and, and manage, do things God's way. With help, God's help. The fifth point here, learn to be content with a reduced lifestyle. That's what Joan and Bob need to do. And of course they need to develop and implement a budget to ensure they're spending less than they earn to generate a surplus, to pay down debt and start to save for those, those retirement needs. Well, those are, you guys had some good answers. Here's another question. What impact do you think Bob and Joan's management of money will have on their children? This is a, these are questions are all important, but this is a real important one. What do you think it'll have? Do you think it'll be neutral? What do you think? What impact will um, this have on their kids with the way they money? They will follow their example. That's highly probable. Good point. Yep. I've got a few here. They'll likely follow their example. It'll be negative. Yep. And they'll copy the parents. Yep. Kids will probably run up a lot of debt. Yep. We'll use credit cards to obtain their desires. Yep. The kids may have to pay off the parents' debt. That can happen. Um, and uh, these are all really good answers. No money for education? Absolutely. I mean, these, these kids, if, if, if uh, Bob and Joan, these parents don't have money and they're up to their eyeballs in debt, uh, they didn't, you can pretty well assume they didn't save for their kids' education. Um, so that's, that's, those are really good answers. It's, uh, here's what I had. Bob and Joan were foolish as they lived paycheck to paycheck for the last 35 years. Hence, it's highly probable their children will follow the same pattern. Remember Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The, the, the most powerful way of training, I think, for parents is to set the example. If you want your kids, I, I think I can think of a number of cases uh, where people, I think of one woman, uh, she married a guy, and she had never, she was came from a Christian, actually a non-Christian family, Actually, they were, they were Christian, nominal Christians, I'd say, but they managed money in a biblical fashion. And just through her parents' example, um, she was a good money manager. And, and often parents, if they display good money management that's consistent with scripture, that can be a tremendous positive impact on your kids. And by the way, indirectly on your grandkids. See, also with, with Bob and Joan's kids, it's highly probable their children's going to follow the same pattern. They'll encounter similar financial problems. Likely both children will graduate from university with significant debt as mom and dad weren't in the habit of saving. And they, they saw mom and dad use the credit cards freely, run up debt, probably heard and, and even answered the phone when some, some creditors called from time to time. And I, I, I said, amazing, I, I'm, I run into some people where I think of one couple that they got married, young couple. They both came from homes where having a lot of debt was, was standard procedure. It was commonplace in the home. So what happened with them? They ran up all kinds of debt. They went bankrupt like within two years of when they were married. Um, both of them, I mean, they're following their parents' example. Now, I, I've seen other cases where it's just one, uh, one spouse out of the two comes from a, 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 a family where bad money management was the, was the, the norm. And another one comes from a, a family where they practice biblical financial principle. And that can actually cause a lot of stress. However, good, it's better to have at least one spouse that manages money God's way than, than no spouse that manage, than having two spouses that manage money the world's way. So um, is there any biblically based financial advice that Bob and Joan should now provide to their adult children? What should they do? They need to learn the biblical principles themselves, but what should they do with respect to their kids? So they just learn it themselves and get their own finances? Well, parents just teaching their kids? I mean, a rule of thumb, save percent, 10 percent, give 10 percent, give 80 percent allowance. Uh, I'd say even when they're young, actually, they probably don't need to spend any more than about 40%, get them to save 50 and give away at least 10. Teach them to give, teach them to, to save is really important. Guide your adult children to managing money God's way. I agree. Yeah, it's, um, there is a scripture that does talk about parents providing for their kids rather than kids providing for the parents, but in some cases that gets reversed. They need to budget. They need to recognize their slaves. Yeah, the lender. They need, they need to meditate on God's word and, and they need to basically learn God's word of uh, managing money. And they did not only do Bob and Joan need to learn that, but they need to um, talk to their kids about it. Tell their children their mistakes and lessons they learn from their mistakes. That's a good one. And you're going to see what I have here because I think they need, that's one key thing. I think they need to humble themselves and explain to their adult kids some of the financial mistakes they've made and therefore encourage their children 
and grandchildren to follow the wisdom in God's word with respect to finances. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselor, Psalms 119, 24. That's what they need to do. And they actually need to humble themselves, say, hey, we've made some mistakes. We don't want you to make the same mistakes. They, that, I think that's important because they've set a bad example. Remember, this couple's been married for 35 years. So the odds are pretty high. Most of their kids have moved out by now and they're adults living on their own. Maybe not. But that's that's um, a pretty good chance by now, and and you know they need to humble themselves and explain to them they they've set set a bad example for thirty five years and tell them hey we're changing things and humble themselves we made some mistakes here we violated biblical principles now they may say honestly we didn't know what they were and that may be be the case but here's what you guys should learn don't follow our example learn these principles and follow them so. They should advise their children to save for future needs, including their own retirement, future health care costs, and their own children's education. And Bob and Jones should advise their children to operate with minimal debt, to learn what God has to say on finances, and be content with whatever God provides. So that's what um, some of the things that this couple needs to do. So um, I'm going to discuss the relevant and application of the following verses. Here's a, a key verse. This, this may seem like a mean verse. I don't try to be mean. But let me read it, and then um, you can give me your, uh, I mean, this one's pretty clear. In fact, though, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk and not solid food. And I don't mean to be mean, but this is a powerful verse. It's very direct, saying them that, hey, Bob and Joan, you've been Christians for 35 years. You should be teaching your kids how to manage money God's way. But in that area, they may be spiritually mature in other areas, but in that area, you need to learn the elementary truths of God's word. I'm going to add one point here. It is possible for a Christian to be spiritually mature in many other areas, but not in managing money. I've seen that so many times. And, and I think that's one of the deceptions of this world. You know, again, in, in church, you often get um, messages on, on character and what we should be doing, what we should do and what we shouldn't do and, and your, your godly character and this kind of stuff. And those are all good things. But uh, there's, there's rarely, there's not much usually on money. And, and so it's possible. I've seen lots of cases. I've counseled lots of elders and deacons and pastors, even at churches that are spiritually mature in many areas, but they're not in finance. And often it's because often it's because they don't know. Now, sometimes it could be an attitude, uh, an ungodly uh, or worldly mindset. It can be that, you know, I want the best. I want it now. I'm, I'm, um, you know, or, or a lie they believe. Well, you can't have a car that's more than four years old. Otherwise, you're you know, going, going to have so many repairs. Well, that's not true. Um, most cars today will last at least 10 years, some of them 15 or 20, depends how many kilometers you put on, how, how you take care of it. I've always been able to get at least 200,000 kilometers out of every car. Um, so some people just believe some, some lies. So we have some more comments here. Um, somebody talked about dealing with an estate and divide family members. Uh, absolutely, I agree. I have eight half hour sessions for radio TV. They're also on our website on biblically based estate planning. And definitely estates can be an area that uh, there can be lots of um, problems with, uh, lots of fights. And there can be even bigger fights. When mom and dad have accumulated debt and when they die, there's more debt than there is assets. That's clearly contrary to scripture and uh, it creates a tremendous problem for the heirs. No question. Uh, how much do you spend around Christmas time? There is a big question. You got to be careful. You have to be careful. First of all, I'm a believer. If you're going to spend, let's say, 600 bucks on Christmas gifts, you should be saving 500 bucks a month um, throughout the year, sorry, 50 bucks a month throughout the year so you have the cash, you don't have to put it on your credit card. Um, or the better thing often is buy gifts throughout the year because often sometimes you can get them on sale uh, throughout the year. When it gets, uh, you know, the last um, four or five weeks before Christmas, the prices tend, tend to be higher and you know what happens on Boxing Day, the prices go way up. So sometimes you're best to buy Boxing Day for the next year. So um, the, um, yeah, these are good comments. So let me go to the, the next slide. Okay, I'm not going to do this 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 um, case study here because I want to get into the summary. Are there any questions? As I, I'm going to actually, um, what's your thoughts on private lending? I think um, it's okay to lend money, but um, especially if you're lending it to a fellow believer, you should do as Jesus said. Lending, expect nothing in return. Be willing to forgive the debt so that it doesn't... Um, Great problems in the in the relationship because often um, you lend. It's often usually a friend or a family member you're lending to. If they don't pay pay the debt, it can create a lot of problems in the in the relationship. 
So you just got to be careful. It doesn't mean you don't need it. You need to pray to discern God's will. Any other questions so far on what we've discussed so far tonight? Here's the summary. This is going to be a summary of all the sessions we've discussed. Um, by the way, I, we talked about lending to a friend or a family member, private lending. I should mention, I think we talked about in one session about uh, giving um, personal guarantees. I, I was uh, interviewed on WDCX radio. This was several years ago and a lady called in. She was in tears. She had co-signed on a business loan for a friend of hers and the friend's business went under and she, she had just lost her house. She was a single mom. She had just lost her house, which had been paid for. And uh, just because she co-signed a loan, which she thought was just, a, just a, a formality, and she didn't realize when you co-sign a loan about 70 to 80% of the time, the co-signer usually has to pay the debt. And often it can destroy your credit rating if you're co-signing a loan and you can't make the payments. And it usually destroys the relationship. It could even be a son or a daughter or a relative of some kind. It's just co-signing is strongly discouraged in scripture. It's not a law, but it's certainly a principle. And uh, be careful with private loans. Be careful with, with co-signing. It's... Um, so here we go on uh, this part here. Um, going back to the first thing we talked about, uh, stewardship. The key biblical principles were stewards or manager of the money material things that God has entrusted to us. God is the owner. Uh, first Chronicles 29, David said, everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. And of course, this one's really clear. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. At that time, silver and gold was used as money. And so God's clearly saying the money is his. Um, he created it. He created everything on this earth. He even gave us all our abilities, Deuteronomy chapter 8. So um, the key principle is we have to understand we're stewards or managers what God's entrusted to us. This is my definition of Christian stewardship. Acknowledging in your mind and heart that God owns absolutely everything and using money and material things in accordance with God's principles and God's will. That's the key. Acknowledge that it's God's and then manage it according to God's principles and God's will. We went through a session on debt. Here's the key biblical principles. God discourages debt and warns of the dangers of debt. It's not a sin to borrow. It's a sin to borrow and not repay. And it's a bad testimony if you don't pay your debts on time or you don't pay them at all. That's even worse. The pattern throughout scripture is for God to meet needs with no debt. That's, that's how it is. Philippians 4.19, Paul said, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say my God in the bank or my God in the credit card company. It says God will meet our needs. God admonishes to save for future needs. This key verse, a real simple one. I mean, there's some key verses you can see. If you just, and they're also at the back of the book. Remember, if you go to the back of the book, the memory verses are there. And I encourage you to, even after this series, to have a copy of them or take a picture with them on your smartphone and have a look at them um, on a regular basis. Because these God's word is powerful. There's truth. It can change the way you think. But Proverbs 21, 20 is a key one. The wise man saves for the future but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. Most people fall into the foolish category. And in Deuteronomy 8, 28, God promises people, if you fully obeyed him, you would, they would not have to borrow. As a matter of fact, they would be lenders. But if you look at Deuteronomy 28, 43 and 44, it actually told the people of Israel, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all the commands I give you today, all these curses will come upon you. And one of them, you go down to verse 43, it says, the alien who lives among you will rise higher and higher. You will sink lower and lower. He will lend to you and you will not lend to him. In other words, you will be in debt. And that's what's happening today. Most people are in debt. So God's perspective is to save for future needs. The world's perspective is to buy now and pay later. Since God is in control, Psalms 103.19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. And since God promised to meet our needs as we put him first, is it not reasonable then for Christians to trust God to meet their needs rather than relying on credit cards, first line of credit, and other loans? And the absolute truth is, yes, it is. And we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not on our own understanding, and all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I would say this. One thing that concerns me greatly, interest rates now are, I believe, the lowest they've ever been in history. Um, I don't remember in my lifetime a mortgage being under 2%. Bank of Canada rates 25 basis points. The Federal Reserve in the U.S., its rate is extremely low. They actually, they don't, they have almost no room to remove. They could theoretically lower it another 25 basis point. But rates are extremely low right now. And most people should be taking advantage of this by paying down their debt. Because if, if your, your interest rate on your mortgage when it comes due is less, that means you, 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 if you want to renew your mortgage on the same term, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, pay as much. But what you should do is, is pay at least the same amount and pay the mortgage off faster. Uh, or even uh, if you got a personal line of credit, if the rates are now lower now. And what's happening is people, 
should be taking advantage of the lower rates and using the extra cash flow that they have to pay down debt. But what's happening, people are using the lower rates to take on more debt. That's why we have a real estate boom where real estate's going through the roof in this city and many cities in the country and, and, and actually even, even around the world, I read some stuff around the world, real estate's been going through the roof because interest rates are so low and it's just, um, so people are actually getting further into debt and, and it's, it's actually very dangerous because when the next, as this recession proceeds and, and, and when interest rates eventually go up again, I can't tell you when that will happen or how it will happen, but the odds are they will go up again at some point. They pretty well have to. They can't, they can't go hardly any lower and they're at the, the low end of the range. They'll probably go up again um, within the next few years, five years, 10 years. I don't know when, but they'll likely go up and those people are going to get stung. So take advantage of low interest rates by paying down debt not taking on more debt. So the biblical perspective is to use minimal debt and save regularly for future needs and be content with God's provision. The worldly perspective is to use debt freely, uh, buy now um, and enjoy, buy now, enjoy now and pay later. And this whole financial deception that smart people use other people's money, that's from the world. That's not from God. So um, I'm going to go through some practical steps to get out of debt in a minute, but I just want to, yeah, it's, um, pray about the U.S. election. We'll pray about that in a minute. Uh, we'll pray about everything. Remind me again. Um, yeah, it's, um, somebody here was extremely wealthy, lived a frugal lifestyle. That's okay if they're giving away to God's work and they, they be called, they're called to live that frugal lifestyle. But if they're leaving the frugal lifestyle because they want to accumulate more and more and more, that's, uh, that's hoarding. And that's not God's thing. Luke chapter 12, um, parable of the rich fool warns against that. Double on pay, double up on payments. If, if one can on their mortgage, absolutely. And this is a good point um, that's, that Justin's made. It's about the increase in taxes. We have a mammoth federal government deficit right now in this country. And the same in the United States, many places in the world. Taxes have to go up over the next several years. They have to. There's no other option. Either that or cut programs. And it seems cutting programs is just not a politically popular thing. So taxes are very likely going up. And as taxes go up, if you've got a lot of debt, you're going to get squeezed even further. Okay, so here's some steps to get out of debt. Always, and a lot of things, when in doubt, pray and ask God for his wisdom and his direction. To get out of debt, to, before you do anything, pray and ask God to direct you, speak to you through his word. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And ask God to pray and direct you as to what you should do, because there's many different ways to get out of, out of debt. Regularly study and meditate on God's word. Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God can speak to you through his word. He can speak to you through his, his spirit as well. Evaluate your present financial position, your assets, liabilities, revenue, and expenses. Be sure you know the condition of your box. Give careful attention to your herds. You need to know where you're at financially. If you're not sure, download the free copy of the Copeland Budgeting System. It's Excel based. It's on our website, listed on on, on the various forms, and um, and and you can determine if you start tracking your expenses on form number six and list out all your assets and liabilities. You can develop a budget, and you can start to have your financial facts. So you can make wise financial decisions. Most people don't know what their financial facts are. They're just, just guessing. Of course, you need to develop and implement a budget. What's the usual? To spend less than you earn. So you have a surplus to pay down debt. Ask God to enable you to be content with his provision. Remember Paul talked about learning to be content. This is a big one. We all need to learn to be content with whatever God's provided to us. Actually, you've got to live below your income. So you have a surplus to pay down debt and save for future needs. Number six, with your surplus of cash, pay off the most expensive debt first, which is usually the credit cards, and pay the non-deductible debt first. Now, for most people in this country, you have non, most people just have non-deductible debt, but if you've borrowed money uh, for, let's say, a business or to invest where the interest is deductible, and let's say the interest rate on that borrowed debt is 4%, and the interest rate on your first line of credit where it's not deductible is 4%, you pay down the non-deductible debt first, and then you pay down the deductible debt afterwards, um, because at least if it's costing you, let's say, 4% pre-tax, it may only be costing you 3% after tax because you're saving some tax on that. And number seven, depend on God, follow up and persevere to your debt free. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And um, the key biblical principle from budgeting is God admonishes us to plan ahead. Planning your finances can best be accomplished by using a budget. Um, there's no subsidy. Don't like it. Call it a budget. Call it a cash flow plan or a spending plan. Pretty much the same thing. Uh, and that's what you want to do. You want to spend less than you earn and have a surplus to pay down debt and save for future needs. 
Guesswork and gut feel decisions are dangerous. A proper budgeting system will provide the financial information you need to make wise decisions. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste lead to poverty. Most people today are making hasty decisions. They're at the shopping mall to see something they like, they just put it on the credit card. They don't really think about how they're gonna pay for that. It's too easy to put down the plastic. Remember statistically, when people use credit cards, they spend 20 to 25% more. That's why when you go to some of these, these stores, they want you to use credit cards because they know you're gonna spend more money. That's why, and, and also most people don't pay it off. So the credit card companies make a lot of money on the, on the loan shark interest rates. Planning and diligent, uh, hastiness, hasty decisions are often bad decisions. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks, give careful attention to your herds, you don't need to know where you're at financially. So investing the time to learn and implement a budget, it's well worth it. Obtain godly counsel. We talked about that in one session. God admonishes us to obtain godly counsel from him personally. First Kings 22.5, Joseph had said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. From his word, and we know Psalms 119.105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And from godly financial advice, if you need, if you're gonna get biblically, if you want biblically based financial advice, you gotta to go to a Christian who understands God's word on finances. Many of them don't. Many of them give advice based on their secular training. So you need to understand God's word on finances. You should know enough from this course to question them on things. If you're going to a financial investment advisor and you say, well, what do you think about investing to forward to invest? And if they say yes, you know that they, they don't really understand what the Bible says and the discouragement about, about debt. And uh, you shouldn't be borrowing to investing. We talked about in the previous session, just save a little at a time over a long period of time. Proverbs 21.5 says steady plotting brings prosperity. Hasty speculation brings poverty. That's the biblical way to save for retirement, kids' education, or anything else. Let me just check some of these. Um, give generously. God wants us to focus on eternal values and not temporal things. Colossians Paul said, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. If we are focused on um, things above, on things of eternity, you're going to end up giving more money to God's work. That's for sure. You're going to end up building up treasures in heaven, as Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6. We need, to, we need to have a focus on eternity. And remember that our time here on earth, 60, 70, 80, maybe you might live to 100, is very short compared to eternity. But how you have managed money is going to have an eternal impact. And it's going to result in rewards or lack of rewards when you get to heaven. And that's why Jesus said, do not build up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but build up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break and steal. Giving to God's work allows you to convert a temporal asset of money in, into uh, eternal benefits. It's the only way I know of to convert something that's temporal into something eternal. Now, there's other ways as well. Providing for the needs of your family. First Timothy 5 8 says, if you don't provide for the needs of your own family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So working hard and providing for needs, I believe there's eternal rewards for that as well. But certainly giving to God's work is a key one. As Randy Alcorn said, R.G. Letourneau, he was the, movie, the guy in, in the, the from 1930s to I think about 1970, he's given away 90% of his income. Uh, there's a good saying, and I love this saying, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And we can't take it with us, but as we do things God's way, we manage money God's way, there will be rewards in heaven, no question about it. And it'll have an impact on eternity. Those people that come to know Christ, they're gonna be there in heaven, and they'll be thanking you for your part and what you did while you were here on earth and using the money that God entrusted to you for, for eternal purposes. Make giving to God's work a priority. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and your barns will be full of overflowing, your vats will brim over the new wine. If I had to choose one scripture on giving, this would be the one. Because what happens with most people? He buys what he wants on credit, she buys what she wants on credit. So they run up the credit cards. What, what have they done? They've really made themselves first. They haven't made giving to God's work first. They made themselves first. And as the debt goes up, the giving goes down. So they haven't made giving to God's work a priority. You need to develop and implement a budget. Make sure you're spending, make sure that you, ha you, you live on rule of thumb, 90% of what you earn. Actually, ideally live on 80% of what you earn, 70 or 80%. So you have some savings, unexpected expenditures, and uh, you, you're able to give to God's work. So you need to, to live, live on less often. And give sacrificially. We know the, uh, the parable of the widow in Luke 21, um, even though what she gave monetarily was very small, a few pennies, Jesus said she put in more than all the rest because she gave out of her scarce resources, she gave sacrificially, the others gave out of their abundance. And if you read um, and the, the, the Christians in Macedonia, 
uh, Macedonia. They they gave um, way beyond their, their ability. They gave gave tremendously as well. Focus on the eternal, not the temporal. Do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is there, your heart will be also, Jesus said. So focus on things that are eternal in nature. We talked about developing godly attitudes towards money in a session. Um, there's a clear distinction in scripture between godly versus worldly attitudes or motives towards money. And uh, motives are very important to God. Proverbs 16, 2 says, All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. They're very important to God. One thing that God's concerned about uh, is, is this motive, as Paul talked about. People who want to get rich, and that's lots of people in this world, people with a lot of money and people with little money or people with average money want to get rich. They fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, Paul said, Notice it's the love of money. He didn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. He said the love of money, that ungodly attitude towards money, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Now, as Paul is saying, even Christians can, can have a problem with the love of money. It's not just non-Christians. Some indicators of love of money, excessive hard work, very limited or no time with God each day, little or no involvement in ministry, giving very little to God's work, and a lavish and selfish lifestyle with no desire to seek God's will. Uh, these are indications of love of money and Christians can struggle with them as well. And regardless of how much money and material possessions you have, I can tell you this, this scripture is so true. Ecclesiastes 5.10, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. I have seen so many successful entrepreneurs in the last 40 years that have had way more than they need, millions and millions of dollars, way more than they need to retire on, and they still want more. They're still watching how they spend their money. They're still pinching their pennies. They're not giving generously to God's word. That can even happen to Christians, by the way. And the truth is, if someone has an issue with the love of money, the money will never satisfy. It's never going to satisfy. It's always going to go on. Um, it's just going to, going to go on forever. And um, one of the root causes of love of money is a spiritual problem and that the individual is putting money and the desires for money and material things ahead of God. And as Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. They either will hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Remember, God could have put something else in there. He could say you cannot serve both God and self, or God and Satan, or something else. But he's, God, Jesus recognized that some people, even Christians, can become a servant to money and material things. And that can become their idol without them realizing that that can become more important to them than their relationship with God, and more important to them than doing things of, of the, that are of e eternal in nature. So um, one of the best ways to deal with the love of money is to ask God to change your heart, ask him to change your heart, pray and ask him to change your heart, meditate on God's words, and you start thinking the way God thinks, and then start giving generously to God's work. You can't give generously, and ask God to give you a joyful, joyful heart as you give to God's work. You can't Give generous, generously in a joyful fashion and still have an issue with the love of money and an issue with greed. If they, they, don't, they just don't fit together. Some other worldly attitudes that can give rise to financial problems is covetousness. That's, you know, wanting what other people have, lack of contentment, greed, selfishness, and pride. These are other worldly attitudes that can uh, give rise to financial problems. Here's some godly attitudes, which is what we want to focus on, that can give rise to... Um, uh, so here's some godly attitudes with respect to money and material things which we need to focus on. One of them is contentment. Remember Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. Giving generously to God's work. Remember Paul said uh, he was so sparingly will also reap sparingly. He was so generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. Unselfishness, thankfulness to God. Instead of Sometimes as Christians, instead of complaining what we don't have, we need to pray and thank God for what we do have. That's really important. And we have a lot in this country. We're very blessed. We need to thank the Lord. And humility is also a, a godly attitude that, uh, that we need to have. Financial deceptions, I'm going to go through this really fast. We've talked about this tonight already. There are beliefs that appear to be correct and they're contrary to God's principles and they often tempt people to get into debt. First one, living paycheck to paycheck is okay. God says this is foolish. The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. The second one is debt restructuring will solve your financial problems. Debt restructuring treats the symptom, not the problem. The problem is you're spending more than you earn. 
and there's many common reasons, lack of knowledge, lack of discipline, lack of contentment or a worldly attitude or motive. And I can say this, um, this another financial deception, if I had more money, I would be happy. And many wealthy people um, have no peace in the area of finances. They're not financially free. And I can say that. I've seen so many people in that situation with millions and millions of dollars. They're not experiencing God's peace in the area of finances. Yet I can sit down with a single mom with a modest income and she has God's peace. Or a single person or a couple with modest income, they have God's peace. Now people can have God's peace even if they have an average income or above average income. I've seen God's people experience God's peace that have very high income. Now, generally speaking, one thing they're doing is giving very generously to the Lord's work. It's not 10%, it's usually 50, 60, 70%. They're experiencing the joy of giving. They're building up treasures in heaven and they can have peace and they can really get excited about, you know, praise God, God bless my business. God's given me more income. Now I can give even more to God's work. What a, what a, what a joy that can be. So true financial freedom comes from only having God's peace in the area of finances. And I would say managing money, God's will. The next financial deception, it makes sense to buy now and pay later in today's easy credit. It's a huge, tem huge temptation. I don't have it here, but one thing I'd say is 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has, has uh, this, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, God will give you a way out so you can, hand, you can hand up, you can stand up under it. The key is this to temptation. I zero in, determine your area of financial deception, financial temptation, and avoid that area. If you're a woman that has an issue with spending too much at the shopping mall, don't go there. And if you have to go there, have a list, focus on your list, buy what you need, and get out. Don't do any window shopping before you know it. You'll you spend too much on, on, on that you shouldn't spend. If you're a car guy, don't go to the dealership and check out the cars at the local dealership. Before you know it, someone will talk you into a big loan, and, and you're going to have all kinds of stress from it. Just don't go to your... Avoid your area of temptation is, is the best thing to do. And how to deal with these? Again, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and get into God's word. Meditate on God's word and God will change the way you think. Now I want to go back to one we talked about early in a very early session, management of money and our relationship with God. How we handle money impacts our relationship with God and our relationship with God impacts how we manage money. Most people would see the relationship with God and how they manage money to be independent of each other. That's not true. They're interconnected. Example, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, accumulating debt, so you're mismanaging money, it's gonna result in stress and arguments, stress on you, it's gonna, you're gonna have your focus on money and money problems and debt problems, that kind of stuff. It's also gonna negatively impact uh, your marriage relationship to the arguments between husband and wife. And your, your, your focus is gonna be on money problems rather than God. And Jesus, remember Matthew 24, Matthew 6 rather, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. For Christians who apply God's financial principles and discern God's will through, through a close relationship with Christ, here's what they're going to experience. This is the key. There's about 10 things here. What you should be experiencing as a Christian, if you're not, get into God's word, study his word, meditate on it, and manage money God's way, and you will experience these things. The first thing is to be content with God's provision and avoid the ungodly attitudes of covetousness, selfishness, greed, which result in so many financial, financial problems. The second is to obtain and obtain God's wisdom and God's direction in managing money. The third thing, and again, these are Christians who have applied biblical principles and they have a close relationship with the Lord. They're gonna meditate on God's word so they have a godly mindset regarding money. They're gonna think the way God thinks. They're going to hear God's voice and follow God's specific will in their life. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. God may not, may not speak to you audibly, but he certainly can speak to you through his spirit. He can speak to your heart. He can speak to your word. He can give you a peace or lack of peace before you make an important financial decision. God can direct you. Um, you need to spend that time in prayer and ask God to speak to you and direct you. Give God the first fruits. Again, this is what Christians will do if they're managing money God's way. Have minimal debt and avoid the pressure from creditors. Develop and implement a budget. And make financial decisions based upon um, their financial facts rather than gut feel or personal desires. They're going to obtain counsel from God, counsel from God's word, and obtain counsel from a godly financial advisor. And in general, they're going to manage money according to God's principles and God's specific will, and they're going to experience God's peace in the area of finances. That's when a Christian is managing money. So the conclusion is how we manage money impacts our relationship with God, and our relationship with God will impact how we manage money. The closer 
you have in terms of your relationship with God, the more you're going to be able to discern God's will, the more you're likely going to be reading God's word. And I can tell you, it's highly probable you're going to start to manage money God's way, experience God's peace in the area of finances. And you know what? The probabilities are pretty good, good, but God's going to trust you with more money. Maybe not. Maybe God's will for you is not to have more money, and that's fine. But more often than not, he will. But that's not guaranteed. He may bless you in non-financial ways, which sometimes are even, even more important. So management of money impacts your relationship with your spouse. I've got a half-hour show on this. Um, I have counsel. It, it is tens of thousands of people since 1982 on what God's word says on finances. And I can say about three out of ten people that I counsel and other uh, counselors in my ministry council are separated or divorced. And by far the majority of the time, money was the most common thing that they argued about. What's interesting is this. Most of the time, there was enough income. That's what I find. Most of there's enough income. But rather, both or one or both spouses manage money the world's way as opposed to God's way. And I say this. Many bad money managers have no idea that their financial habits can destroy their marriage relationship. No, most, most people have no idea at all. I, I think of a case with a fellow who was a leader in a church um, and, and um, his wife left him. And the problem was he was spending excessively on tools and buying a new car every three years, four years. I think of a situation with where uh, where, where a couple, they split up and the wife was spending too much money and accumulating debt and the stress just accumulating over, over the years. I mean, I'm not, rec I never recommend divorce or separation. It just sometimes happens. And we've also seen cases where, where if both couples learn to manage money God's way, we've seen so many cases where, where as, as we help them relieve the financial stress, the stress comes off and the marriage relationship heals. And in many cases, they fall back in love again. Um, and it, we don't give any marriage counseling advice. It's biblically-based financial advice. What I find is most marriage counselors are not equipped to give biblically-based financial advice. They'll deal with other stuff. And often, sometimes we will refer people to marriage counselors if, if need be. But often they're coming to us mainly because they got financial stress. And if we can help relieve that financial stress, the marriage relationship can be can heal. And couples can fall back in love again. And if you're in a marriage where, where you're all stressed out about finances, it is solvable. Let me tell you, it is absolutely solvable. I've seen hundreds of marriages restored, marriage relationship restored, this through giving biblically based financial advice. And of course, the people have to follow it. Um, it's, 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 it's actually quite simple in many ways, because often people are violating God's word without knowing it, or they may have a godly mindset that has to be changed. So, um, and many bad money managers, they have no idea that that's going to destroy their marriage relationship. They just haven't got a clue. The Shemitah for finances, that's the idea that every seven years debt should be forgiven. Now, there was supposed to be a big crash in the economy and the real estate market predicted by that guy that wrote the book on it. I can't remember his name. Um, in September 20, 2015, and nothing really happened of significance. So I think the concept still applies today. I'm not sure it applies exactly to the day anymore, but the concept is what the concept was that every seven years, Amongst the Israelites, debt should be forgiven. What it did was it prevented people from getting into a lot of debt. And every 50 years, all debt should be forgiven, I believe, was, was, was the, the plan. But that's not being followed today. Look at the way debts have been accumulated, especially by countries and provinces and states. And um, it's, it's, it's almost like there's no end to this. It's, it's, um, there, should, there needs to be a timeline as to when you know, debts need to be paid, paid back by a certain date. It's... it's um, it shouldn't go on forever, and certainly governments have have decided to just just continue to increase the deficits. And there, there needs to be some, and even with people, I mean, let's let's deal with what you can deal with as an individual. What you can do, you may not be able to control what your government does with respect to spending. You certainly should give your opinion and writing whatnot, vote appropriately, no question. But once they're in power, there's not much you can do about it. You can certainly pray, and we should pray for our governments and leaders that God would give them wisdom and direction. But you can't control how they spend money and how much deficit they run, but you can control how you spend money. You can control how much debt you run up. And I think every Christian should have a plan. You need to be debt-free totally, for sure, before you retire, even no mortgage, everything. I recommend plan to be debt-free when you're much younger. Try to get debt-free as soon as you can. I think of a fellow who went through our course back in 2008, 2009, he had been mismanaging money, him and his wife. They had all kinds of debt. They learned to manage money God's way. God did incredible things. 
Within about five, six years, they were totally debt free. They had even paid off their mortgage. It was amazing. That freed him up so he could go on and go into full time ministry. He could actually, actually, what he did was he went to Bible school and seminary to train for full time ministry. And he was able to do it. If he was like most people, had all kinds of debt, he couldn't have done that. He went to Bible school, seminary, trained full time for, 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 for ministry, and, and he's a pastor today. He, he wouldn't have been able to do that if he, if he hadn't, hadn't have managed money God's way. And so we need to have a plan to, to pay off our debts as soon as practical. I mean, if you're younger, don't, why not try to be debt-free by the time you're 40? This fellow was totally debt-free by his late 30s, him and his wife, and they had the freedom. They had a surplus of cash as well. And they were able to downsize their home. And they had a freedom to do a lot of things a lot of people don't have. They had that flexibility. So try to get debt-free as, as soon as you can. Uh, the Shemitah, the concept of, of, of um, having a time frame when you get rid of debt makes sense. But is it going to happen on a specific day? Um, I'm not convinced of that. Is it, are we going to? But one thing I would say, the biblical principles, when individuals borrow money and they spend too much and accumulate debt, in due course, they're going to suffer the consequences. And the same thing's going to happen uh, with governments and that kind of stuff. The truth will set you free. Good comment. That's John 8, 32. It takes years to accumulate debt, and it's silly to disappear. I think it's going to disappear in a short period of time. I agree with that. It usually takes longer to get rid of it than it does... Um, Amazon.ca is dangerous. Actually, it could be. You know, you go online to spend, it's easy to spend, right? You see things you like. Yeah, this is a good scripture. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, Therefore, everyone hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against and beat that house, yet it did not fall because it has its foundation on the rock. People who have built their finances on the rock, the word of God, will survive this recession. And they'll, they'll do fine. People who follow the world's way are likely going to suffer. They're going to they're suffer the consequences. But it's never too late. It doesn't matter. Even if you've lost your job, start to learn God's way of managing money. And I've seen it too many times. God's hand will start to move as you manage money his way. Uh, he'll start to, yeah, he'll start to, to move. Yeah, investing in a second mortgage, be very careful. Because you're second in line. And if the borrower can't pay, you've got to service the first mortgage or let the first mortgage or take over uh the real estate and office office often the first uh, the, the first like say the banks in first place on on, on the, the first mortgage they have the first mortgage they don't really care about you in the second position so uh, i would i would tend to stay away from second mortgages uh, they're generally higher risk we all pay for government debts through inflation yeah and also taxation yeah we are a blessed country i agree i'm not disagreeing that but they're We've got a mammoth deficit right now in this country, and the United States has the same thing. Taxes are going up. That's one thing I say with confidence. I don't know when. I don't know how. I don't know how much, but they have to go up. Uh, the government can increase the money supply, but deficits they actually have to pay, or there's minimum they have to serve it, service the debt. Um, so they, they, the debts are, debts are going up, or programs are going down, and I doubt if that's going to happen. So here's some things for follow-up I encourage. Restudy the book. Uh, go through it again. There's so much to learn here. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'm going to encourage you in a minute to consider joining some of the small groups we have on this. Going through this a second or third time is really good. And even even actually leading it if you feel led, because it can actually be led quite easily if um, you use, use our online interactive version, Financial Management God's Way. It's on our website. And what happens there is I, I, you click on a video, the leader becomes a facilitator. They click on a video, I teach a biblical principle for three or four minutes. I ask a question, the video stops, and then you discuss it in the small group. And then you click on the next video for the suggested solution. I speak for another three or four minutes, teaching a biblical principle, ask a question, the video stops, discuss it in your small group, and there's about 15 videos for each session. So it makes it really easy to lead a small group, even if you haven't done it before. Go to our website. There's lots of resources there. Uh, most of them are free. Some of the things um, we do charge for, the CDs and DVDs, the book. And if, uh, if you're really hurting financially and you can't afford it, send us an email, explain your situation. We'll send it to you for free. Um, Develop and implement a budget, of course, is important, and the budgeting system and the uh, instructional videos available on our website for free. Financial coaching is available. Um, one thing you can do is send me an email. I answer questions uh, quite often. If you don't get an answer from me within, let's say, three or four days, send it again because it means I probably didn't get it. Because I usually answer all the questions within, a, within a, say, three or four days. Certainly wait a week. If you don't have an answer, then we'll send it again. We also have uh, sometimes people need more detailed financial coaching for their particular situation. 
And so they need to complete um, the forms of the budgeting system, Copeland budgeting system. And then we give them detailed financial coaching. It can be by email. We can give advice by email, by phone, by Zoom. Uh, we give it um, on an online basis and it actually works, works pretty good. Um, and I have a number of financial coaches that can help. Um, our ministry, uh, the scope of financial ministries, even though it's, it's uh, I have the founder and the president, we do have lots of people involved in the ministry that are helping out on a volunteer basis. There, there's no money to be made in this ministry, by the way. But um, we do have, um, certainly, um, we do have volunteers and looking for volunteers for financial coaching, leading small, group, small groups. One of the neat things, one of the blessings of COVID-19, it's forced us to go more online than we were before. And now we're seeing doing small groups is easy. Um, when I advertise across the country, it's easy to get. Actually, we've got more than enough. We've got three small groups coming up, and uh, one of them's almost full already. The second one's almost full. Um, so it's, it's – um, and we may we'll try to add an, another one or two small group leaders, but uh, it's, it's so easy to do it. So um, if you're interested in getting involved in the ministry, just send me an email. Pray for the ministry. I'd really appreciate that. Satan does not like what I'm teaching. There's been all kinds of unusual things happen in my life. My life has been threatened three times. And people have tried to sabotage the, the, the website. Satan does not like what I teach at all. He doesn't like it at all. Uh, so he's, he's done some things to try to distract me, but it hasn't worked. I'm going to do this until the Lord takes me home. And certainly give as the Lord directs one time or ideally automatic monthly donations. Um, if you're interested in monthly donations, send me an email. If you do one time, you can certainly go on our website. This is not a pressure task. If you can't afford to give them a ministry, I will understand. I've actually received a couple of checks from a few checks and donations from some people already that have gone through this group. And we appreciate those donations. The main thing we use it for, nobody has a salary here. And I, we need to claim as Christians, Second Chronicles 714, where God said, if my people, he's talking to us, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Um, what COVID, you know, um, and if you look at verse 13 of Second Chronicles 7, it actually talks about a plague, and COVID is a plague. It's a plague. This Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles, rather, seven fourteen applies today. Um, first time in a hundred years we've had a pandemic. It applies today. So um, this this can be a, a tremendous wake up call uh, to people where they'll start looking up to God instead of just focusing on money and material things. And it can even be a bit of a wake up call to Christians as well. And so we need to. I think it, my prayer is that we have a spiritual revival throughout the world as a result of this. And uh, a number of thank yous here. I appreciate those thank yous, uh, words of encouragement. And some people have indicated here they've made some, some changes already. Thank you for your, 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 your blessings. This would be a great resource in a church. This can be done in a church. Uh, just find a church leader that wants to lead it. Um, they can use the online interactive version. It can be done. And by the way, if you have people that are interested in the church, have them sign up. It doesn't matter. We don't have to be in the same neighborhood anymore with the technology today. I mean, that's one of the blessings that technology today. I mean, we've had people on this webinar from PEI as far uh, west as, as British Columbia. We've had a lot of people in, uh, in Alberta. We've had people in Saskatchewan, Manitoba. We've had people in the United, throughout the United States, especially in the Buffalo area where I'm, I'm on a radio show there. We've had a number of people and even people in the Far East. We've had some people even in Africa hooked into this call. I mean, it's that's what's great about the the technology today. We praise God um, for um, for the technology. God's enabling us to reach the world. Yeah, I think these are some tough questions. I don't have a simple answer to some of these. Should I buy a house in another country? I'm not sure about that. It's for retirement. Um, if, if you want to live inexpensively in Canada, look throughout Canada. And there's there's some places in Canada. I was in Halifax and uh, Middleton, Nova Scotia a couple years ago. I'm amazed. Uh, I, and even you go to some other places in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PI that the price of houses are much cheaper than they are say in the greater Toronto area. So um, it's, it's um, am I planning another one of these like webinars? I probably will do another one. Certainly I'll do an advanced one, but the small groups can do it. Uh, there may even have to, we get a lot of registrants. There may have to be sort of a large small group as well. And these are, thank you for all these comments. Some people are saying it's been a great eye opener. A lot of thank yous here. I appreciate that. Some are interested in the advanced seminar next year. That uh, that'll be on our website, and we'll certainly do an email blast if you're on our financial moment email list. For me, this is building up treasures in heaven. I don't I don't get paid for this. I don't get a dime from the ministry. I contribute to it in a very significant way. But that's what God's called me to do. Some really nice comments here. I appreciate that. Um, if you're interested in the courses, uh, get on our financial moment email list, and um, 
and we'll certainly have notices going up probably the beginning of January. But if you're interested in any of the small groups that are starting shortly, um, go to our website and you can register. That's where you uh, where you can register. It's um, yeah, someone here that's younger saying, hey, I'm so happy and honored to learn this. It, the sooner, the earlier people can learn this, the better. Uh, but even if you're older, it's not too late. Um, you can still manage money and, and finish the race um, very well. So I think uh, I'm going to close in prayer. And somebody asked prayer about the U.S. election. I think we need to pray for the leaders in the U.S., United States, in Canada, around the world. And we need to, uh, I'm going to pray for you folks as well. I'll start off. Uh, Father, I thank you that your word says so much on finances. I think you've given us so much wisdom, Lord. I thank you that through your spirit, you can even give us specific guidance and direction to choose, make the best decision when there's several options within your biblical guidelines. I thank you for this group of people, Lord, who have uh, definitely shown an interest in learning your words on, on finances. And I pray that everyone here would follow up um, and um, not just be a hero of the word, but also a doer. They would follow up. They would continue to learn more about what your word says on finances, and they would um, would would implement them and also provide their testimony. Um, I forgot to mention it, but if people could provide their testimony by video or even an email or whatever of how you, Lord, have changed their, the way they think and manage money as a result of this study on your word on finances, just guide and direct them, Lord. Father, we do pray for what's happening in the United States. Um, Tomorrow on today on the election, we pray that uh, that whoever gets in, Lord, that somehow you would touch their hearts and that they would make decisions that are consistent with your word, Lord. Um, so many decisions have been made by governments that are inconsistent with your word. We pray, Lord, that you could just, just have some godly leaders there, that they would make decisions that are consistent with your word in the United States and Canada and uh, everywhere in the world. We pray, I pray, Lord, there'd be a spiritual revival throughout the world, and not just uh, amongst the people, but among the leaders as well, and uh, that we could uh, see things, see just a massive change of people turning to you, Lord, accepting Christ as Savior and Lord, and uh, then learning and managing money your way. And so we could experience your peace in the area of finances, and we could also be blessed by you both here on earth and in eternity. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again so much for participating. Uh, if there's any questions, send them to me by email. And, um, oh, yes, Darlene's put it here. If you want to go onto our Facebook, Darlene's put the link in there for Facebook. Good one, Darlene. Um, and second, number of people who are interested in um, the follow-up in September and January. And feel free in the meantime, even though the one in January will be advanced, Feel free to go over this book in further detail. Go over it again. Um, there's so much to learn. There's so many scriptures in here. Um, and and um, just, just make it a habit of studying God's word on finances. Go to our website. There's a huge amount of resources there. And most of them are free. It's uh, You guys have been a great, uh, it's the first time I've done a webinar and, and gone through the chat line. But uh, I think I've done webinars before, but this is the first time where it's it's been coast to coast with people. And that's that's been fantastic. It's uh, been a, You folks have been a tremendous, uh, tremendous blessing to me. And if you have any questions or anything, just uh, just send them. And a lot of nice comments here. I really do uh, do appreciate the comments and words of encouragement. And uh, you guys have been an encouragement to me. I really um, praise God. And feel free to send. Uh, when Henry sends out the email tomorrow, asking for your feedback, we'd love to get your feedback. Love to get the testimonies. And if you have any questions, you got my email address. Just uh, just send them to me. God bless you. This has been a it's been a great webinar. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I'm going to do more. That's that for sure. It's um.